probably why. Well, what can I say? Continuous. Okie dokie. Time to get this show on the road. So, <clears throat> five o'clock, it's April 11th, and it's time to call this meeting to order, this governing board meeting here at 570 Lito Galindo in good old Rio Rico, Arizona, and the governing board room of the Santa Cruz Valley Unified School District 35. Would everybody please stand for the pledge? And Ms. Vasquez, would you please lead us? Yeah, absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Okay. Roll call. Ms. Susan Fobian. Present. Mr. Joel Kramer. Present. Brad Beach. Present. Lourdes Vasquez. Present. And I'm here too, so that makes a fab five. We have a quorum. Thank you. Adoption of the agenda, Mr. Dugo. Uh, no recommended changes, thank you. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. I hear a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes by zero. Do we have any call to the public? No. Okay, so <clears throat> moving right along. Select policy services, Mr. Dugo. Uh, thank you. Uh, this evening we have Mr. Billy Berry from the trust. Uh, here to discuss the trust policy services. Um, as you know, currently we have ASBA as our policy services um, group that uh, supports us with that. Um, the trust has created uh, the new policies utilizing um, the attorneys that are entrusted to the trust. I'm gonna go ahead and let Mr. Berry explain that. Hi, everybody. I'm Billy Berry. I'm the Model Policy Program Manager at the Arizona Risk Retention Trust. Oh, I forget how tall I am sometimes, so sorry about that. Uh, so I have a presentation tonight to go over with everybody, but I also want to open up a dialogue. So I find that uh, you've joined 17 districts now, so we've had a lot of really positive changes, districts from uh, really large to very, very small. So we'll go through this, but at any time, please interrupt me with questions. And we'll go from there. So a little bit about me. I started with the trust in October of 2022. Um, before that, I graduated Arizona State University College of Law in 2019. Um, had worked as a Title IX coordinator and a risk manager at Scottsdale Unified, as well as their public records person. So I get what it's like being in a district on a day-to-day -day basis and how crazy things can be. So uh, I appreciate everything that you guys do on a daily basis for, for the kids. So uh, to get started, uh, so what is it? So uh, basically we created uh, K through 12 district policies that are rooted in law. Uh, they were crafted by some of the top litigation, uh, excuse me, the top attorneys in Arizona and they were created from scratch. So this is something that they went back to the drawing board, went back through the course. Um, the CFR, ARS Title 15, and created policies that would uh, benefit school districts, of course. So the reason that we started this is it's districts wanted something that was nonpartisan. They wanted something that was strictly uh -huh. in compliance. Uh, there was unintended liability and concerns that arose out of that. Uh, and of course, as you know, the trust assists members with their overall risk management, but we're more than an insurance company. We're more than just risk managers. We're here to obviously ensure that everybody is abiding by everything that they should be doing. Um, and of course, just give districts another option because that's what we are. So we found the best way for us uh, to do this is to develop policies on our own. So again, um, nonpartisan, the big part of this is they're customizable for districts needs. So obviously local control is a huge thing for governing boards because policy, yeah. you guys. So we'll get into that a little bit more um, on how customization is really at the heart of policy. So again, uh, user-friendly interface, they have an easy numbering format. It's chapters one, two, three, four, five. It's policy one dash one or one dash two. 
So here's a breakdown of what our five chapters are. So district governance, uh, chapter two is our smallest. It has two policies in there that have to deal with the superintendent. Then of course, business operations, human resources and students. Uh, there's a glossary of terms. There's a quick start guide. So the way that these policies will work is I know that different districts use different policy um, platforms, whether it be uh, board docs, whether it be policy bridge, however it is that you use. We use something called Microscribe, which uh, we'll get into that in a second too. Of course, trust policies are copyrighted, but anything that's your district created po policy is yours. That's totally yours. Nothing to worry about there. Um, policies can also be posted on your district website. Some districts do want that, the, the link to that goes directly to Microscribe. Some want um, the entire policy manual on their website as well, which we can handle that. So here's a little bit of what the policy platform would look like for the two districts that are live right now. That number is gonna go up about 13 more by July 1. So of course there's gonna be a much longer list to look through. So uh, the top is template manuals. So that's, if you're just wanting to mill around and kind of see what we have in there. And then if you wanna see the district specific examples right now, we have Queen Creek and Dicer. So this is an example of what an actual district platform will look like. Um, then this is how they break them down. Queen Creek was a little bit different. So talking about customization, they went in and they wanted everything. They wanted all of their forms. They wanted their, uh, their policies, regulations, which we call procedures, everything listed in there. So you'll see like, 1-101, um, but then you'll see 1- uh, my, I'm not wearing glasses today, so I think that's 1-105A. Oh. Yes. 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 yes, so there you go. <clears throat> and so that's going to break down basically a procedure. And so Dysart took a little bit of a different approach. They just put everything in as is and are basically adding the meat back to the bones as time goes on. They did policy first uh, and then they're adding procedure in uh, and hopefully to be done with that um, by the beginning of this upcoming school year. So this is where I really wanna get into the idea of customization. So. Policy 1100, which is DISART's district goals, 1100 wasn't a policy. It's 1100 as a section, but 1101 is where it first starts. So if you have something that's super specific to your district and you want to include that, I mean, if you have uh, like a dis district specific goals or something similar to that, that's not a problem. This is an example of like the forms. So this is something where, uh, Anybody could go in, download the PDF or the Word file, and then have that. We have districts right now that want those to be fillable PDFs, which we can absolutely do that as well. So we have some testimonials from Jim Dean at Dysart, and then Perry Berry from Queen Creek. So this is where I want to start talking about customization with everybody. So this is a list of all of the districts we have right now. So for example, Flagstaff wanted their model policies to have Oxford commas. So what we had to do is go through all five chapters, all policies, all, yes, it was, yes, that's what they wanted. So we said, okay, Skull Valley doesn't have a superintendent, it's district administration. So they said, Billy, can you go in and remove anything that's a superintendent and change that to district administration? Absolutely. Um, going with, uh, Kyrene, they want their own specific glossary of terms. <laughs> that, absolutely. So those seem like, okay, pretty, pretty basic types of customizations, but when it gets into things like facilities names, there's not a policy in here for that. If you want a policy procedure on that, we can do that. So this isn't like a uh, paint by number book where you wet the where you wet the paintbrush and you put it in there and it's automatically that color. This is however you want it to look. We will do whatever we can to help you. And a lot of times it's something as, hey, Billy, can you, oops, for comma, can you get all of our forms and put them into the right format? Absolutely. So lots of weekend working, but, you know, 
That's what happens sometimes. So again, customization, however you want these policies to look, that's not a problem. So getting into program fees. So how it works is there's the $255 one-time member setup fee, and then annually that's $240. So it's $495 to start and then $240 um, as you move forward. Obviously, you'll have PPL fees if you participate in prepaid legal, which I'm, I know you do. So you'll have that. And then comprehensive policy review, what that is, is within a three-year period, we can say, okay, well, we can look through all of your policies, see what needs to change, um, and do that for you. But that's not something that we would keep districts needing even until 2025, 2026, because all of these are new as of fall of last year. Uh, Billy, just real quick for that, that question there. So the, the comprehensive policy review um, would be after we've already created our, yeah. our transition and plan, because I think that was something that I think that like the board was looking at to, to do a study session in, in June to relook re at our current policies. But if we say we switch to the trust, then that would be part of our initial $495. No, so that's going to be, so the comprehensive policy review is after you've had like your chunk of policies for X amount of time. And let's say that there's things that you don't use anymore, or you want to condense, or you want to combine, or you want to remove, however that is, that's when we'll go in and do that. But with right now going through and trying to figure out, mm -hmm. people, what do we need? What fits us best? That's something that either myself or my other half, Jennifer McLennan, will work with you on, obviously prepaid legal, and that's just part of our service for you guys. And then uh, just a, a, another question related to, to some of that is um, legislative changes that cause uh, policy updates. How does that work? Yes. So we're actually in the process of tracking everything um, that's been in the news, that's been on the legislator website. There's a lot that is, looks like it could be coming down the pipeline. Um, we actually have plans to do training sessions um, in August. We're launching our very first policy governance summit, which obviously all districts are welcome to come. And one of the talks at that is going to be specific on legislative changes, what we expect to happen, how we're going to roll that out, what that's going to look like. So we've we've seen some changes so far this year of things that are just kind of moving along that we need to do, but that is part of it. That's part of the education to make sure that we're well aware of that before it's like, oh yeah, this is changing tomorrow, let's fix it. So, so, there, so there's no cost for that? No, 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 no. During the, yeah. the, the fiscal year? No, so the, the fees that you see, not the, the $1,000, but the 255 and the 240, so the 495, that would be your startup fee to join the program. And then you had a question, sir? I have several, but I'm going to let you keep going. Okay. I would just, just going to say that, I mean, the comprehensive policy review, that's a one, we say do it, with, but isn't it a living, breathing document where if we see something three months from now, we want to go in? Yes, and that's that's part of it too. So the, the $1,000 is more of like after a chunk of time passes. But if you see something in a policy that's like, Billy, this doesn't look right, or I want to change this, Obviously, it's a procedure that's going to be easier. If it's a policy after it was board adopted, you would just email that over to me, and then I would get that live for you within ten minutes. So that's all of this, all of those housekeeping things. That's part of the four ninety five, which would eventually be the two forty every year. I was going to say we don't have to worry about too many legislative changes. The way things are going, oh, no, no, not at all. Everything is being received. Okay, so district transition. So what I want to bring up about this is it's really specific on a lot of districts. Some want to do a very fast track. So 60 to 90 days, that's what we did with Dysart and Queen Creek. Some want to do six months, a year. We have districts that just signed up last week that want to go live July 1. Uh, Whatever we can do to make that process as quick and easy and painless for you, we will. Obviously, um, it'll be hectic because we're already in almost mid-April, mid, yeah, mid-April, which is frightening, but um, we will go through that process with you. So again, you would just let us know if you decide that's something you want to do. 
once you get the agreement signed, you'd send that over to me. You'd get your, of course, uh, the invoice and all that, you know, the fun housekeeping stuff. Then from there, what happens is we schedule a phone call with uh, whomever, the prepaid legal attorney, Jennifer and myself, and we go over everything. What are your district-owned policies that you know you want to include that you could send over to us to get formatted correctly? How long do you, do you want to fast? Do you want to fast track? Do you want to do a medium approach? Do you want to do two years? Do you want however long that is? And we basically just tailor the process to you. So, however that looks. Question? Yes. Current policies are they owned by us or? Are so fitness area. So anything with a copyright, you would definitely need to talk to your prepaid legal attorney about to see how anything without a copyright should generally be yours. But if you didn't see a copyright symbol, you would need to speak with prepaid legal on uh, the other provider owning uh, that specific document. So then, of course, uh, modify the policies, which we've discussed. And then, of course, board approval, if you want to do study sessions, if you do a, a one swift swoop, um, however, like it really is however it fits the district and your needs the best, we'll work with you on. Um, so, of course, once everything has been reviewed and approved, you obviously want to notify your policy provider to with your intent to cancel. And then you'd send all of the policies over to Jennifer and myself, and I'll do one last review to make sure all the formatting is correct. And that takes about two weeks to upload into the system. So, and again, that's more as time progresses that we can go over. So again, annual updates based on legislative and case law changes. If something happens that needs to be changed right away, obviously we will communicate that to members. The comprehensive policy review as requested, again, that's not something that you would need to think about for at least two, three years. That would be more of, okay, this isn't working, that is, or we've had forms, we don't use them. We need all of this changed. And if little bits and pieces change as time goes on, that's great, but if some, for some reason you decide, hey, everything's fine. And then three years go by and you're like, oh, we don't use this. This isn't working, we don't need that. Then we can go down that road. So this is if the district is not in PPL, which we don't need to worry about that one. Um, obviously with next steps, it's really just reviewing some of the, the templates talking about what you need as a district specific, like how long you want to take to, if you decide, obviously we're just not another option, but if that's something that you want to do, um, the agreement webinars, um, there's a lot of trainings that are also coming up uh, that we'll be conducting with boards and staff on a myriad of things. Um, and I'm more than happy to send all of those documents to everyone after we conclude the evening. So then, of course, um, Jennifer McLennan, myself, your member services coordinator, we're all here to help you however we can. I'm a text, a phone call, carry your pigeon away for whatever you need. So, so now, I know we rushed through that, but I really do want to start asking what questions, concerns, comments, or things I can help you with that um, you guys are maybe thinking about. Slogan. I really have done it in a way. It's like almost too good to be true. So I'm not asking you to put down yes. star. <laughs> but um, truly, it sounds great. The customization sounds. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, I can't stress it enough, but I mean, really, local control is the heart of a governing board. And that's for you guys to control and however fits you, that's not us. I'm just here to help you however I can. And again, you know, it's it's simply, this is your district, this is your community, and you obviously know them a lot better than I'm ever going to. I think everyone here is lovely, but you guys are gonna know, you, you know your foundation. Thank you. Ms. Anything sounds really good. I, you know, I have never, I don't know what this entails and what that, you know, but um, I go with the majority. So, yeah, it sounds really good. It sounds good. So, thank you. Absolutely. Beach? I guess mine would be, Dave, what's our current model policy? Do we have one or? Yeah, so, so we do. So we have uh, 
ASBA is our, our current policy mm -hmm. services. Um, and the, the and I think this is something that, that maybe Billy can answer because the question is always, why is there such a significant difference in cost? Because our, our current cost for policy services is $4,884 a year. So the trust will then come in at you know, 240 or 400 and 495 for this first year. For the first year. <laughs> so it's a significant cost difference. So I, I don't know. I, I know you get that question about yeah, can the trust do this up with, with so and again. So in going back to the idea of unintended liability, we know that keeping students safe, keeping staff safe is the most important thing because when things aren't going as they should that's when things start rolling out of control and that's where these huge costs start to come in. And of course, if it's something that needs to go under prepaid legal and then the trust has to take over. So this is our way of knowing that, yes, it seems like it's too good to be true or it seems like it's too inexpensive, but at the same time as we see the exorbitant costs that affect us as an entity and by having the proper policies and procedures in place, that in the long run is gonna save everybody money, so. And, and also just to answer some of your questions with that as well is um, anytime we have a policy question, we call our prepaid legal attorney. Okay. So, so now <laughs> kind of well there. together, now the person that's creating the policy and knows our policy is our prepaid legal already. So it's the person we go to anyway. Thank you, Mr. Verdugo. Thank, Thank you, Billy. Absolutely. Anything else? Questions, comments? Mr. Kramer? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the presentation. Absolutely. I'm sure you've heard a lot of questions, and I don't want to get too far in the, far in the political realm of this, where this led to and where this is going, because certainly you guys are the main people behind our law conference with our, when I say ASBA, we're members of that. So you guys are the, are, is the direction then going with you guys to maybe have your own law conference? I'm so, asking that because I know you, you've always been there for us. So we actually in, so it's August 24th, we're doing our very first inaugural policy governance summit. So that'll be held at Hilton Tapatio Cliffs. Uh, more information will be coming out by the end of the week. Uh, all districts, of course, are invited. We'd love to have everybody. Um, so we want to make sure that districts are just, you know, in the know of everything that's changing and however we can help but is that your guys' direction? I'm not trying to do your No, no, no. So no, I I no. So I mean we we're gonna provide members tools and resources as anyone else would, kind of like how we do our risk management summit every year, or we do uh we participate in like the ASBO conference every summer. So we constantly do things to educate our members. Uh, of course, we'll continue to offer education and events, but it's nothing different than what we've already done just with our other programs like risk management or uh, like the transportation things that we'll do. Right. And you guys, I mean, you've, you've said it, it's about local control, which you're trying to push back onto the board. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's the policies. All, yeah. yeah, it's all about you. It's all about what is best for your district. You know, we we don't know the ins and outs in every day. I mean, work in the school district, I know it can get crazy. Um, but how you best deal with that is no better than I ever would. But at the same time, the, the prepaid legal attorney will then tell you, if, yes, that's a, an okay policy to make, or no, you can't. Correct, yes. Right, and just, again, I'm looking, I, I guess I'm looking at the future of this, because where we're going to be, and this will be a question internally, not so much with you, because you're provided of the information on what the trust is doing. And you've always, like I said, you've always, the trust has always provided us, districts, with certainly a lot of information, yeah, what you just said, I know even with uh, all the the emergency evacuation plans, things to that effect, you guys certainly had, and this is, I'm going back 20 years, even at that time, you had provided all the templates for that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you still do them with that as well, correct? Yes. So and it certainly is a one size fits all for all of us in that area too. Like we had um, questions from members about public records requests. So in our quick news, just about a week and a half ago, we released a Q&A from public records requests, because that is a huge, huge issue for a lot of districts. And from doing it, I know um, how crazy that can be and how that can really turn things upside down when you don't have a dedicated person that handles them. But anything that we can do just to educate and help our members just grapple day to day, will do in any sense of the word. 
my final, I guess, the, not so much with you, but certainly with the, Mr. Verdugo, because we discussed this. Where does this put us then if we move in this direction and the board decides to go in this direction? Where does that put this with ASBA? So we, we would still be members of ASBA um, because uh, fees would be less? Our, it would be significant, as I just mentioned, for policy services, it would be significantly reduced. Um, yeah, the, it's up for renewal, and that's one of the reasons that we're meeting as well. Um, so we have to make a decision, and we will um, add it to the next agenda uh, for the board to, to make a decision of which policy services we want to utilize. So we would still be if we did went this direction with the trust, we'd still be members of ASBA yes. just for for membership as well as because of our insurance. Our health I was insurance. gonna say it yes. still falls on that yes that situation there. Yes, correct. Okay. Well we find a different route for that. Yeah. Maybe the trust is going on that route too. Yeah, we've met with them. <laughs> really? Yeah. You see? And stop shopping everywhere. Exactly, I was going to say. Yeah, you that's all. That's you're all. Giving them ideas. Well, I'm like I said. I just whatever. I'm sure that's been discussed. That's why I asked. Right. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you again. Absolutely. Yeah, really. Thank you for your time. Thanks, really. Bye. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, I'm part of the member governing board here. Yes. So, um, when you say, I had a question for you, Mr. That was significantly reduced. When we were first talking before the meeting, thought that we would pay them and we wouldn't have to pay ASPA correct at all. Correct. So if if we um, are up for renewal with ASBA, so ASBA has different. There's different parts of ASBA. So there's um, which is kind of off topic with our gen item, but it it they they cover the membership as well as currently our policy services board docs, um, and our and allow us to be members of the insurance consortium with, of ASB. Right. So we would still be members with that, but we would remove the policy services if we chose to go with the trust for policy services, which like I said, annually it's $4,884 and they're requiring a four year commitment. Um, and so- and That's a considerable yeah, saving. Considerable saving mm -hmm. uh, because the initial 495 for the trust and then it becomes two hundred and forty, so we're saving you know, four hundred, four thousand six hundred dollars annually in the future if we minus the two ninety five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, not here. Yeah. Okay. Well, so there is. You guys, as Mr. Kramer mentioned, you're not even contemplating this thing with a health insurance. I mean, well, so we have, so we have our, we have Kairos, which is our, which I'm totally like not. And, and like involved separate, separate, it's a separate entity. Yeah. Yeah. So it's part of the trust, but it's not like part of. And that's thing. something we can discuss at, um, later because it's not on the agenda. But it, it is something we have explored. Well, I had a few other questions. You said that you you said we we can make the changes later on. You know, if we adopt, we decide to go with you guys. You said different points you make changes for us with regard to the documents. So my concern is I can understand the ones coming down from the state legislature, but I just want to make sure that you guys don't make changes without in effect governing board policies that we try to institute here. Oh, absolutely not. No, if there's something that's governing board policy that you change or you say, hey, this policy, we want to reword it or rephrase it or remove something, that would be something, of course, you would have to vote on. And then you would just send me the document to update. Okay. I just want to make sure yes, that no, we don't wake up one day and we see the document, you know, down in June and say, hey, what the hell? He took this out. And that was part of something that we had voted on. No, no, absolutely not. No. And, um, well, I'm happy when you said, I'm quoting you, that you guys are nonpartisan. I remember having a meeting once a long time ago when I was first here and talking to one of the board members about uh, ASBA. And, and I remember the document that we signed and when we went to our swearing in ceremony as governing board members. And I remember it clearly stating, and I remember talking to Mr. Schaller about this, huh? we swore to execute our duties impartially. So I was very happy to hear that you had said that you're nonpartisan because we have to be careful. We have to keep our guard up 
regard to that kind of thing. And not we try hard to refrain from that kind of thing, and it's so I was happy to hear yes, it. Kind of hard. Just wanted to mention that to you as we uphold our duties, right? Absolutely. And the other one I want to say is that it doesn't, if we do decide as a governing board to change and go with the trust, it doesn't really break my heart when I see the difference in cost, nor when I think about how ASBA treated our chief financial officer, Mr. Cella Brown. You're not aware of that, but this governing board is. And so I just wanted to make that very, very clear. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. Was one of yes, the, Chief. Yes. And so that we would, Mr. This is for, we're, we would keep with board docs too, correct? Yes, we would keep with board docs. So it's just it's policy services. Policy services. Yeah, just adding that to the, the trust side of things. Because again, we are members of the trust. We have prepaid legal. Okay. All right. We Thank you. We have the right to go to the, the ASBA conferences if we choose. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to turn around this time and really try to go. Thank you. Thank you. Run while you can. Okay. Safe return to in person learning plan update. All right, thank yeah, you, Mr. Lugo. Yeah, thank you. As as required um, by the, the just looked here. That's all right. We have to have a quick return uh, update. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Mr. Shadler. There you go. President, members of the board. Oh, yes, correct. Uh, every six months, um, we have to update our safe return title, safe return in person learning. This stemmed from the time when everybody was in order to welcome students back to campus to submit the hands of ADE to. To uh, receive the ESSER funds. And then part of the requirement at that time, every six months, we would update the plan. So tonight is really just a, our six month update. Um, so you, we follow the same format we followed a few times now. There's really only four, I believe, very, very minor changes. This is the first one that you can see right here. Um, it's, it's under the, can you go back up a little bit, Shampi? This is under the heading of. Safety recommendations. So um, in terms of it says restrooms will be sanitized. It had previously stated several times per day. We're now back in a place where we're sanitizing the restrooms on a daily basis by our custodial staff, which is prior to the whole COVID thing happening. Um, I'll just go through the remaining updates and then entertain any comments if you if that's okay. Classrooms will be vacuumed weekly. Um, and then that one have been doing daily, but we've moved that back to weekly. Um, this one says that SCV 35 continues to assist the Santa Cruz County Health Department uh, and Marip Mariposa Community Health Center with promoting and planning vaccines. Yeah. So at the time, we were actually sort of taking the lead on that. Dr. Lunderville and her team were really taking the lead with them, but we just modified the language now that we continue to assist them and work with them as our partners, but a slight shift in the, the, the leadership behind those clinics. And then the last, I believe, recommended change is right here. It says that um, as it, originally all classrooms were using Google Classroom as uh, their sole source of classroom communication. Obviously now we're back in person. So Google Classroom remains as one of our communication options for, for um, teachers and students, families, but other more traditional methods are also used to ensure that all students uh, remote or in person have access to all the inf information that they need. So um, with that said, like I said, those are very minor changes, I think, um, we've all been on the board for about the duration of this situation, so I think you know the, the, what the plan has been. Mr. President, this is also an opportunity for members of the public to to um, share any comments, if that's, if you entertain, I don't know if we have any public members here, but um, this would be an opportunity for them to share, just give feedback. This is not a voting item. It's really just um, feedback from, from you as community representatives. Does anybody? Does the board yeah, have any questions? Anybody have any to stay here? Talk about it. I ran it over and it's good. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Mr. Kramer. Did a wonderful job these last few years. Hopefully, I'll say this with hindsight, it's always 2020, but I know that we had a lot of information given that sometimes was squelched. They said it wasn't true, wasn't that 
false narratives and everything to that effect. Some were true. Also, just cite NBC News. Because some people say NBC News this way or that way. But NBC News gave a report that stated mm -hmm. that those that did get COVID were just as good as having the immunizations. That report did come out on NBC News. I don't know if I want to get too much into it, but certainly we hopefully that we can learn from this as a board because a lot of boards followed a path of let's follow the path and everybody's doing this. Yet those of us that discuss things, sometimes there was, for instance, charter schools in Tucson that didn't shut down. They had kept it, their schools open the whole time. And I knew parents that had their children there. No harm, no foul. They kept moving on and they kept getting through it and everybody did well. So I'm just saying that. I'm not saying because all of us before you were part of that decision, hopefully that if it does come again, that we've learned from this and maybe we can keep our kids intact more protect them more and keep them in school because we're finding those of you that are principals you're already having and talked about the ramifications of not being in school and there's so many outcomes because of that so i just want to put that out there because i think that we sometimes can make decisions without being pushed because everyone else is doing it. that's my opinion thank you thank you sir thank you for shedding light on it i just like to thank dr Lunderville because we all remember she really guided us through that time with all the vaccinations and the testing and the trace contact tracing and so you. you did a hell of a job and we couldn't have gotten through so smoothly without your hard work your dog at work and superintendent for keeping us cool during that time with the governing board but i also would like to commend the governing board for having voted five to zero to give the superintendent the authority to get through it without having to come to us all the time because i think that would have been very hard on him and i think that was one of the reasons we were successful because we gave him that kind of leeway to take care of things as he saw fit and uh the last thing i want to say on that steve is god forbid that we ever go through something like that again because i think that was the most challenging thing that we ever faced as a governing board god forbid that we ever go through that again Thanks, Steve. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Superintendent's report, Mr. Google. Thank you. Uh, it's it's uh, nice to be back here in person. Uh, just uh, a few things. I um, wanted to thank Mr. Fanning for giving the uh, We Serve Realtors a tour, um, which is our the Board of Realtors. Uh, so Mr. Fanning gave them a tour, which I think was very informative for them. Uh, I think they learned a lot. Um, the Board of Realtors is, is a group that supported our district through a lot of things, especially during the uh, uh, override and bond. You know, they, they supported us getting that information out. And it's one of the groups that that helped support us. I wanted to thank Mr. Fanning for giving them the tour. Um, tomorrow, we will be hosting the Chamber of Commerce Government Relations meeting. Um, we'll uh, thanks to Dexo for uh, providing breakfast. There are we're having the uh, food truck here tomorrow morning. So if the board is, is available, you can come and grab a breakfast burrito if you'd like, or the uh, government relations meeting will be hosted that tomorrow morning. Um, want to congratulate uh, or thank Mr. Stada for being the guest presenter for A for Arizona on the reimagining instructional time. So thanks for being represented for our district and presenting to that in a statewide group, um, and I think even some national individuals uh, that were tuned into that call on, on how we're utilizing instructional time. So I want to thank him for doing that. Um, we have the uh, district talent show tomorrow. I think Mr. Fanning is performing. Um, oh, yeah. um, district talent show at the high school tomorrow. So if the board is available for us to attend. Um, I also want to congratulate the uh, students that participated in the two back, uh, I think, high art show. Uh, we had some student winners, and I, I don't know who they are, but we'll, we'll bring that to the board at some point. Um, and then also wanted to give a shout out. One of my favorite things, uh, and unfortunately I won't be able to attend this year, is the ROTC Ball, uh, which will be happening on Friday. Um, and it's, it's one of my favorite events um, because they do such a, a great event of um, making it so formal with the handshake line and all of the different things as they introduce themselves. And so I want to, to uh, apologize to them that I won't be in this Friday, but I know it's going to be a great event. Thank you. Governing board member report, Ms. Fobian. 
Thank you. Um, last Wednesday was the, it was technically an art, but it had its own name, creativity or something. And really congratulations, Mr. Estrada. That was so well done. Um, even with the breeze that was happening, everything stayed stable. It was super to see the kids' inspirations for what they did and the photography was excellent. But again, really, um, it was so well done. If it happens again next year, I would certainly invite, you know, community members. It was exceptional. And congratulations to the top 5%. Um, that's always exciting, and now there's so many because your student body is and your that class is so much bigger. Yeah. Truly, congratulations to those kids who've made it that kind of grade level. Ms. Vasquez? Um, same thing. I was just going to say that. Um, uh, congratulations, Mr. Um, Estrada, for all of the work that the kids are doing, and uh, it reflects on everything that uh, the administration is doing as well. So, you know, really good. Uh, have a lot, a lot of kids that are that are way up there in the five percent, and uh, it's going to be a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, reunion with all of them. And some of them are mine when they were in sixth grade, as I know they are. So, but um, I'm very happy that um, that the, you know, I'll, I'm going to be going to that one. I can't go to the ball, and I apologize that I can't. But um, I have another uh, something else that I have to do with my daughter. So, I'm sorry, but uh, congratulations to all the kids. I'm glad that I'm going high. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. I just want to say congratulations. It's always good to see Granada and Nogales International of uh, bringing back our tennis team. And that's something that I know we've been pushing for years. Granted, we had it 12 years ago, I believe it was, when the last time we had a tennis team here. But certainly it's good to be having that because I know that we have a lot of talent. Hopefully with that pool going, the same thing, we bring back the, the talent. And that's our whole point of it because I think in three years, it's gonna flip. Our Rio Rico tennis teams are gonna be that much better. So I wanted to say that I think that's a uh, good shout out to what we've been trying to do. Certainly it's important to get everyone involved in athletics and it's always uh, good to see what's going on with your schools. Again, I certainly like everything, the feedback on social media. It's always nice to see that as well. So, thank you. Your beach. Yeah, just a shout out to all those students, student athletes that are signing their letter of intent, their academic scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, noted in the, the, the Hawk News is uh, Francisco Ariana, Ariano, Jesse Callejo, uh, Andrea Verdugo. She was also uh, honored for academic and uh, community mm -hmm. service. I saw the all, all Kids Bike donated a bunch of bikes to our, mm -hmm. our little ones. That is outstanding. Uh, promoting good health, promoting uh, just that bond uh, and getting them out there on the roadways and you know teaching them how to ride safe in the helmet. So uh, kudos to that organization for doing that for our district. Uh, shout out to Hector, Chris. You guys went to Washington, DC. Thank you for ad advocating for our district. And uh, Mr. Fanny. John, John, I already give you a 10 on the talent show, baby. <laughs> yeah. That's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Beach. I just want to thank all the teachers that have gone through all the changes this year with personal life learning. But again, there are a lot of unsung heroes out there. That the changes are very hard on teachers in the classroom. And so I just wanted to commend them for remaining cheerful and positive and working hard for the kids. And we hope that they come back next year. And uh, thank you again for all that you do every day. So. Thank you, Doki. 301 program vote for school year 2023. Yeah, thank you. Um, so annually, we have to review our 301 plan um, and then take it to the school sites for a vote. So I'm going to turn over to Mr. Chadley. Thank you again. And uh, that's correct. We, we, um, had a, we have a committee every year, and the board has gone last year. We were really hard for the first of the entire year. We made some very significant changes to the 
here we, we didn't want to let all that settle and, and see what the feedback was. And so the administrative team, which was comprised of myself, Ms. Cabrera, and Ms. Kios, as well as Ms. Padilla, um, we had no recommended changes for the committee, but we asked them to talk to their teachers. Each site was afforded two representatives from the school site. There was about 14 of us all together. And the, um, they also had no, they bought feedback, had no recommended changes. And when we do the vote, uh, I think the board will receive the memo. The, the um, overall, because we, we need to have a 70% for the entire uh, eligible staff. Um, and so the overall was 97%. We had the lowest scoring school, if you will, was 93. We had some schools with 100% favorability. So I think the changes we made, we worked so hard on last year, seem to have been very well received. But uh, Mr. Rudy was correct in bringing that to the board tonight for a formal approval. Okay, uh, any discussion, Ms. Swobian? No, it's very clear, thank you. Vasquez? Um, same here, very clear. Mr. Beach, no questions. Mr. Kramer? Ah, the teachers supported it. It's all good. I feel the same. So do I hear a motion to approve and adopt the proposition? 301 program for school year 2023 is presented. So moved. Second. Is there a motion of second? All in favor? Please aye. say aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Okay. Thank you. Well, for, uh, uh, propose and prioritize topics and possible dates and times for future board meetings. Uh, does any board member have anything that they would like to? Um, yes, um, yes, I do. Okay. I'd like to uh, see if we can revisit the um, uh, the what is it? The procedures or for, for the naming of the buildings? Because you know there are so many things that are going up now. Okay, including what we had talked about. You know, district office and all that stuff. And I think that it's, um, it, you know, I, I want to revisit it and I want to see how we could come to a, you know, like an agreement on, on, on the specifics on what it is that, that we want in order to name it after whoever. And so thank you. I think you can. You yes. Know. Yeah. So we, you know, we can bring back that policy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if, if we, if we, uh, yeah, yeah, it was on the future topic. So we can, we can add that back. I think yeah, we I think we really need to come to into agreement as a board on what are the what are the criteria in order for us to you know to put the name on some on, yeah. on a building on I mean we're gonna have a new library we're gonna have a new you know I mean I think that that's where you know we will, we we don't, so we won't come into any issues after yeah, that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else, Mr. Kramer? Yes, with speeding up the process here, hopefully that we can have our district administration bring back to us then the trust policy services as soon as possible, according okay. to on your timelines, of course, but yeah. we certainly want to get that done sooner than later. Yeah, it'll, it'll be on the uh, next agenda. Let's see that here. Yeah, yeah, for discussion. Okay. What's Mr. Beach? Uh, nothing right now. I'm just talking about it. Just talking about it. And I don't have anything legitimate. So, moving right along. Um, just before we leave that, that section, Mr. Ramirez, I apologize. Um, so, the um, Mr. Ramirez and I had, had discussed um, the change in meeting time, uh, moving our uh, April 25th meeting to April 18th for uh, the purposes of contracts. So, tonight, um, you know, the, the board has requested that we have that uh, study session annually to discuss the budget and, and get uh, an overview, uh, but we still need to get contracts out in a timely manner. Um, so if we could, I would uh, request that the board move our April 25th to April 18th. Um, I know that means we're in back-to-back -back weeks, but it also allows us to get contracts out um, in a timely manner. But also, then we would not have a April twenty fifth meeting, so we wouldn't have uh, three meetings in this month. Just we just have this one, and then um, we have a break. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that is the request. So any discussion, Ms. Hogan? It's fine with me. Ms. Vasquez? Absolutely fine with me. Mr. Beach, good. Mr. Kramer, yeah. You good. I'm just waiting. Yeah, we get we're gonna motion it. Yeah, we're gonna motion. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I'm kind of just holding off on saying yes or no. To... Okay, do I hear a motion to move the regular governing board meeting scheduled on April 25th, 2023 to April 18th of 2023? So moved. Second. Your motion second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes by zero. Thank you. Okay. Um, it says here the motion to move the regular governing board meeting. Oh, no, no, no. Forget that. Consent agenda. Any matter, the consent agenda will be removed from the consent agenda and discussed as regular agenda items upon the request of any board member. Does any board member have anything they would like to remove from the agenda? Okay. Uh, Ms. Holby? No, thank you. I should call you one at a time. No. Ms. Vasquez? No. Mr. Kramer? No. Beach? And I don't either, so been a while since we removed something. Mm -hmm. So, do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda agenda as presented? So moved. Second. And a second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Motion passes. Five zip. Mm -hmm. Budget study session. Mr. Verdugo. So then we can uh, go ahead and, and relocate into. Uh, uh, things available up there, and we'll then have a study session. We don't have to make a motion here, do we? To end the regular board meeting, then go to study session. Yeah, we're still in. Right. Right. I just want to make sure we're not yeah. violating any. No, no, perfect. Yeah, we're still in. A, we're still in a regular meeting, so we're just moving to the next agenda item, which is the board study session. Okay. All righty. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we could turn from there, we would need to consent. Okay. The presentation, um, our copy as well. Okay. And then you'll have all of the. Yeah, we made sure because I knew that. Next step was uh, on so I can see him. Challenge. Hi. Okay. No, you're okay. Yeah, I'm fine. It's fine. Hey, I'm doing. Get a bike riding. Been... Okay. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I saw. Uh, remember last? Yeah. And this Mark went out. Yeah. 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 Good one. Oh, yeah. I have to. Hi, Mr. Shadron. So you're are you going to do a song and dance or? He's going to do Jaja Bing. And you're going to do Jaja Bing. Jaja Bing. Oh, I want to be there. Can I be a judge? It's just a small bit. So, Mr. Verdugo? Yeah. MC, you got the floor. Yes. So um, last year, um, the board requested that before we give out contracts that we spend some time looking at the overall budget um, so that uh, they can have some, some input, ask some questions, get some clarifying questions answered. So uh, knowing that, we decided to have the, the study session tonight and then again, push that meeting so that we can approve contracts at the next meeting. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Brown who has put together a presentation of a, a kind of an overview of the budget. Um, as we go through, if there's any questions, please feel free to, to ask. Well, I got one right off the bat. Sure. Do the principals really need to be here? I don't think they need to be here for this. I mean, this governing board study session, so yeah. they, they agree to go if they want. Yeah, they can, but I know some of the items affect them, but it's up to them. I mean, obviously they can. Well, not all of them are anyway. So. Yeah. Kind of unfair that not all of them. <laughs> And besides, it's a governing board study session, so they don't need to be here. Yeah. And go home. 
Unless you want to be here. Yeah, unless you want to stay and hear with the beach entertainers. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brown. You're not a principal, you have to stay. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> good night. All right, take it easy. Good night. All right. Yeah. Um, good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. As part of tonight's um, presentation, and I know this, the format is a study session, so please feel free to ask questions as I go through the presentation. The intent of the presentation is just to guide our conversations. Um, the study session. So please let me know if you have any questions as I move along. Um, It'll go through some of the major operating budget initiatives. Um, so there is no capital um, in any of the numbers that you see we're looking at tonight. This is strictly um, operating costs, and M &O. Um, Before I go, I start going through the budget management plan in the form of the, of the presentation. I just wanted to share with you some of the behind the scenes process of what I call the budget dance, right? Um, this is that's what I informally call the process. Um, it's a process that we start in the fall and it culminates late in the spring. Um, and then we formalize everything when I bring to you the state um, forms. But by then, you already approved contracts, you already approved any salary increases. And as you know, that um, captures well over 80% of the budget. So basically what we're doing when the state finalizes the budget and releases a new state form, we're just formalizing all the discussions that we've had before to everything that you already approved um, in prior meetings. In the, in the fall, when we start the process, um, I start working on our development projections. As you know, that is the foundation of our budget that tells us and gives us an idea of what we're going to have for financial resources. But most importantly, it also helps us guide our conversations in the area of staffing. So we start to have staffing meetings with principals where we put in front of us a spreadsheet that has all their staff that they have available at their site. We also, and we're not only um, looking at classroom staff, we're not only looking at teachers, we're looking at um, any, anyone, anyone that's assigned and that's supporting their building. Um, and most in, we also highlight as part of that discussion, the funding source that is linked behind their positions. Right? Um, we highlight if any of that funding source is in, in jeopardy or it's coming to an end. Right? The, the, in this case, like ESSER comes to mind. The 100th day grant is another one that we're struggling with. Um, and then most importantly, at the bottom of that spreadsheet, we list the site school. Uh, we always want to have those in front of us, right? We also want to make sure that we don't lose track of what we're here for and what we're aiming with all the resources that we're allocating to the sites. Um, as we go through that process, we try to be very, very um, aware that our, um, today's choices and what's the impact on our future financial um, availability of, of resources, right? So what decisions we make today will impact how many resources we're gonna have in the future. And that's something that I also like for the principals to be well aware of. The other thing that we that we look at through that process is um, analyzing their staffing. And like I said, answering that question of how those that staffing model, which is the majority of the resources that are linked to the sites are helping them accomplish their goals that they have established for the year, okay? Um, and I always tell them we can fund anything, we just can't fund everything. So that's that's something that we, we keep in the back of our minds as we go through our discussions. Now, um, so we start on the left-hand side looking at 
projected revenue. Um, in the fall, we have absolutely no idea what the state is going to do with our budget. Um, yeah, Isela, can I just interrupt? So Mr. Strada wasn't in here when we told everybody they're excused all the principals, so you feel free to, to leave if you don't. I mean, there's no sense in you staying here for the, the governing board that session, so okay. you're free to leave if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the area of revenues, I start looking at the projected carryover, um, calculating our contingency for the new year, our set-asides, and then um, obviously the state budget um, it's still pending. On the other side, when we're looking at expenditures, we're looking at our compensation. So how much can we uh, start making projections for what a salary increase, increase would look like? Um, this year, we uh, started a compensation study for administrative and professional positions. So we'll go through that information here shortly. <coughs> we are looking at uh, reviewing and putting in place a performance stipend for administrators. And also, what what can we do in the area of benefits? Then we go into staffing. Uh, we're looking at is there a need for new position? Is there any new purpose? Any of the positions? Also, reclassifications. Sometimes the scope of the positions and the duties and responsibilities that are aligned with that position. As we make shifts in our operations, sometimes we find ourselves needing to reclassify that position to address the new needs of our buildings. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes we get requests to increase the number of days for support positions. As you know, not all support positions are 12 months. Right? Um, some end and start when the when the teachers come and go. And sometimes um, based on feedback that we get from the principals, they have the need to keep those um, staff members a little bit longer um, at the end or, at the, or bring them earlier at the start of the school year. Then positions with the change in funding source, right? Um, this is common now with the ESSER funds going away. Um, ESSER 2 now is, is the, the, the grant that is going to sunset at the end of this fiscal year. And then the state and their changes to the 100th day grant, right? Those were unexpected. Yeah, we were communicated in January. Uh, changes in allocations to um, departments. Sometimes uh, we need to we look at how much money we give them to buy consumables <laughs> or um, spend on PD, and, and um, so things are getting more and more expensive every year. Um, then we look at our op overall operation cost, the cost of utilities, we're adding square footage, doing a projection on that, our liability insurance, right? We were hearing from the trust, although the conversation was focused on the policy services, but they are a liability insurance provider. And so just like any other insurance, just like your insurance at your house, they will send you a renewal quote and it's based on your losses from the prior year that they'll, they'll um, give you a rate for the new year. Um, facilities contract. We do outsource uh, facilities. So that is something that um, we have to take a look at um, annually. I do not list food service in here because food service, it's a... Um, self-sustaining operation. Meaning we do not pull from our m and to um, offset the cost of food service. So we make sure that that operation is um, funded through the federal government and the cost of the operation and the amount of meals and participation that we have makes it a self-sustaining so it doesn't pull from other sources. Okay. Um, and how much money we have available as of today. Um, I am projecting a carryover from this year into next year, um, which is the sum of carryover plus operational savings. What are operational savings? When we were um, receiving the one-time COVID dollars, there were expenditures that we had the ability to shift into those funds. Okay? And we were able to capture savings as a result of that. Okay? but we knew that one-time funding was going to go away. So we, we were very careful not to exhaust that savings that we captured, because at some point we were going to have to start bringing some of those expenditures back into it. Okay, so that adds up to $6 million. Then for next year, based on my enrollment projections and the teacher experience index, 
we are going to capture seven hundred thousand dollars. You said that was that six million part of all the like electricity and things that we save by not having students on the campus. And... Yes, Mr. Ramirez, it could be the sum of the the electricity, fuel, Plus transportation. Absolutely. But... So utilities, fuel. <clears throat> um, no one went into overtime that year, and um, substitutes. Subs. Yes, absolutely. So the sum of that, but this is also normal carryover, is what adds up to those six million dollars. What is a normal carryover? Normal I mean, this carryover. is affected by COVID, right? Two, two million, two point five. Five. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the state, well, the state were pending to see what they're going to do with their budget. Uh, currently, the only thing that I can tell you that's for sure, because it's in statute, is that they're going to give a 2% increase to the base support level. There are proposals, and we'll go through those at the end, um, to increase the base support level. That is the amount that we get per student by more than 2%. But we know that in statute, at a minimum, they're going to give us 2%. Okay. So $6.7 million is what we have available. Okay. Then we have contingencies and set asides. The contingency amount of eight hundred and ten thousand one hundred and eighty four. Then we have contingency for aggregate expenditure length. Remember that this is something that the state has not fixed for public education, right? And we I they had. I thought we were all celebrating that the other day. But they they passed it for this year for fiscal twenty three. But they did not make any modifications in the law to prevent it from happening again next year. Okay. Seriously, so you got to go fight again? Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, they, they did not institute a long term fix. They just went ahead and just put a band aid for one year. And they're going to deal with the same dilemma next year. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing, it's, it's still a, a political football that's going to be either into next fiscal year um, that would uh, require us to, to have this set aside in case they choose not to approve it. Um, but the anticipation is that there will be um, at a minimum they would approve it, but we can't take the chance of expending or moving this money into our contingency until that is resolved. So they have, uh, you know, like we mentioned this this year, our district wouldn't be in, involved with that, but there were some districts that would have to have shutdowns and things like that because they don't have this set aside contingency that, that we have. Right. Well, they have until March 1st to, uh, to have us hostage <laughs> until they decide to take action. Yes. Which is very unfortunate that they do that. But for the Alaska's sake, I just want to say that we, the the state used to force us to have a four percent right. Continue used to be a four percent. Continue used to be, but we don't do that anymore. So yeah. Ms. Brown just kind of does it on her own, which is kind of cool for us because we then we don't never operate in the black. So the, the red. Yeah, we're always in the black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so four percent was the maximum right. that we were allowed, and that was removed. Our contingency fund, though, it's not what it used to be. I remember Mr. Beach mentioned recently that we used our contingency fund on the last meeting and yeah. to help with a pool. I remember him talking about that, and it was a good thing, and I agreed with him. But uh, it seems to be smaller, right? Our contingency fund than before was that because of the pool, the the half a million we had to spend on the pool. No, um, this is so the pool impacted my projection of the carryover because so I went ahead and took it from there. That carryover amount would have been higher than I took money away from that for the pool. Uh, and then here, your contingency is in essence line one and line two, so two point eight million dollars. I'm just they're both contingencies, right? Um, I'm just labeling the second line as earmark for the aggregate expenditure limit. But if that passes again in March 1st, um, then the district has a total contingency of $2.8 million. Or or the other thing is that we, um, that they could 
pass some type of legislation to remove it. That's that's the bigger hope mm -hmm. that, that we don't that they have something permanent in place, but we can't count on the, the current legislation. Which allows us to spend more money. Uh, yeah, which would allow us to, to well, we'll still have that contingency. So okay. it's still contingency, but it's a contingency to protect us if the aggregated expenditure limit is not approved. Um, so it's still a contingency. And then the other set of sites there are decisions that we made um, for the classified initiative that we put into place last year. Um, so we have to have those set aside to make sure that we are able to meet those raises annually um, because we know that that's a, the long term, how much it's, it's going to take for us to, to do that. And so, so, that, so really we have a contingency of $4 million and set aside that we're, we're doing now. We could remove some of those things, all those things, but that's not something we want to recommend or anything. So this is really just to protect the district and keep us in the black, you know, moving forward. Right. Thank you. So this is just putting the first and the second slide together. The total revenue projection, 6.7 minus, we're gonna set them aside. Okay. I'm gonna put them to the side, the contingency and the set asides. And this four million dollars leaves us with two point six million dollars to work. Okay. 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 Except one thing: How do you feel about that heading into the future? How do you guys feel about that, you and the superintendent? Because that doesn't sound like a whopping amount. You know, in the event of any change, big change or unforeseen. I'm fine because we have the contingency and set aside of four million dollars. So. I'm telling you that you have six million dollars to work with to earmark for just in staffing yeah. or yeah. salary yeah. increase. So, so, this, yeah. so we, we are we are in very good fiscal shape. Very, very good fiscal shape. And that this is nowhere where years ago when we were making cuts and, and everything. And, and you know, and Mr. Shatter remembers my conversation. When are we gonna stop talking about cuts and, and talk about um, things that we can do, and now we're at that point of things that we can do. So that's what we're excited to share some of those things that tonight. So I'm going to start with um, the compensation study. So we did a two, three years ago. We started with the teachers. Mm -hmm. We did a compensation study for teachers to make sure that um, their their compensation was aligned to market, so that we could be competitive in that area. We did that, and as a result, we made adjustment. Then came along the hourly positions because of what was happening to the um, minimum minimum wage, and we did that um, study, and we came back with a recommendation to adjust the placement guide as a result of that. An expensive measure, remember, but we we took care of it, and we're moving forward, and we're very proud um, that those positions are aligned to market. So now it was the time to look at the positions that were left. And in this case was the administrative and the professional positions. As part of the study, there were nine districts that participated in the study. You can see them from the list. And there were a total of 43 positions. And my apologies if this is huge, I need to read from the screen. The doesn't make it any better. But there were a total of 43 positions. And we moved it to pay to advance to the next slide. Um, then um, it's just a continuation of the positions that were part of the study. So the approach to the study was exactly the same as to what we have done for the other employee groups. We perform a compensation study by an outside firm. Um, then based on the results, um, it, the recommendation would be to adjust the placement guide to market. And then the third step is to assess the placement of the positions back on the revised placement guide. And then last but certainly not least is to perform a cost analysis. Um, to see if we make sure that the changes that we're making are something that we can afford and more importantly that we can sustain. 
And just, just before we leave that slide, just so that the board is aware, community is aware, is that when we do this, uh, our last group to, to really look at at the compensation because we wanted to, we started with the teachers on the front lines. We start then our next group was the classified, and now we're looking at all the other positions that are affected, which is you know something that as our district we always want to make sure that we look at everybody, uh, and then this. Now, the next step once that Ms. Brown's going to talk about is that we then look at what's better for the employee. So if the, if the compensation on the new placement guy is less than what they currently are because they may have been with us for many years, then we say, okay, that the new placement guy isn't for you. Um, you're still going to be moved, but we're going to give you your salary increase based on the percentage because that's better for you. Um, so that somebody doesn't get hurt by a new placement guy, because you'll see that some are, it's, it's not better for them to be on the new placement guy because the market is different. And so we're already paying them and we're not going to take money back from an individual. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever is better for the individual, that we are going to put that in place. So if it's moved to the new placement guide, then that's where we'll place them and that's better for them. But if it's can continue with your current salary and get the salary increase. If that's better, then that's what we would do because the, the placement guide is just that. It's a placement guide. It doesn't mean it's set in stone. It's whatever is better for the employee. So I just wanted to make sure that we're clear on that. So just to add to what Mr. Verdugo was saying, um, the results of the, of the study came back with 22 of the positions were identified to be below market. Um, then 12 positions were identified to be at or above market. For those positions, it's going to be the, the employee will benefit more from the salary increase that we are projecting for next year rather than to place them on the news on the revised placement guide. That makes sense because they're already at market and in some cases a little bit over the market. Um, so it doesn't make sense to put them back. Um, and it's it's exactly it happened with every single employee group. It happened with some teachers. It happened with some hourly positions, and now it's happening with administrative and professional positions. Then we have seven positions that came back with no comparable data. Um, what it means is that HR Mosquitoes is working um, went back to the districts that are that participated, and is gathering more information. Um, sometimes we can have different titles for positions in our districts. Um, so, and, and they might not have a, I don't know, I don't know, a, a certain type of coordinator. Well, we call it um, whatever coordinator, they might not have something the same title, but when you start pulling actual job descriptions, then you can find the similarities um, on the positions. So it's just going to take a little bit more time so that we can define those seven positions that came back with it. Then we, um, our district, had two positions that were not part of, that were not in our placement guide. And we are going to use the data that came back from the study to actually place them or add them to the placement guide. Um, so once again, the recommendation would be to align the, the placement guide to market based on the study results, um, place the positions back to the revised placement guide, if and only if that is the best um, measure for the employee. We're not gonna hurt anyone. We're gonna receive the negative increase. Um, and then the estimated cost of doing that is 192,700. Now let's take a look at the guides so that we can, because there's a lot of talking that I need to visualize. So this is our existing placement guide. Please notice how grade 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 read the same. And then Felipe educated us that 35,568 is actually like the minimum wage for salaried positions. And that is determined by the Fair Labor Standards. Mm -hmm. So that is the minimum that you can make 
If you're not going to clock in, you clock out. That makes you an exempt employee. So you're an exempt that's, that's the minimum amount you can be paid to become an exempt. And teachers are not part of that. Whole teachers thing. are not part of that, by the, the I labor. The, I can already see the questions. <laughs> teachers do not, teachers are, are exempt, exempt. Yeah. no matter what. So even if they were back at the 20,000s, they would still be exempt. Mm -hmm. If that's the what the labor, okay. the labor. But we still have compression, right? Employees. This is compression right here. Let me just yeah. right, the fact that grade 14 pays the same as grade so that 18. 17 or 18. Well, the employees, that's what's always on my mind. You've been with it for a long time. Don't get punished. Right. That's what we're trying to do with the new placement. That's what we're trying to address with this guide. Take a look at the new guide. Notice how we made some changes to the grades and where the positions fall. And those changes were made based on the data that we received from the study. So I'm going to just take uh, the executive assistant. The executive assistant in this placement guide is above the uh, transition specialist. No, it's, we took that out. Oh, uh, we removed. Yeah. That's the other thing that we did. We removed from the placement guide positions that we no longer have. They're not, they're not active. Mm -hmm. So just to have a clean um, placement guide of only active positions. Anything that's not active, we mm -hmm. knowing that we can always bring it back and place it on the on the placement guide. So I'm gonna go back to the previous slide if I can do this right. So the executive assistant here is at a lower grade than the college and career ready success coach. Okay, now let's take a look at the new guide. You see that change? <clears throat> now the executive assistant is at a higher rate than the college and career ready success coach. Does that mean? Does that mean? I'm sorry. Does that mean that the uh, that their pay is going to change next year? Yes. So what's going to happen? If we vote on it. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, the, the recommendation is for yes that they're paid to to be increased based on okay. on what we learned with the market. So that's why we're sharing all of this information so that you can see that yeah. when we when we make decisions on salary, they, they, it's one it's on the market. It's, Best for, and then what our budget is. What is our budget? Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, huh? so we always want to benefit our employees as much as possible. I think that's one of the things that we've been very good about, you know, looking at each employee group to make sure that we're giving as much of our budget to salaries, which is over 80% of our budget is, is salaries. Mm -hmm. And so we look at, at all those and then try to fairly place everybody um, based on what their job is and what the market is. What the market is, yeah. Because that, that's, the, that's the thing that, you know, there are some jobs that just generally make more, you know, and, and that's and that's and it's a hard to fill position, a needed position. So that's why we go out and, and do these studies to make sure that we're being as fair as possible. Um, and it doesn't mean it's going to be, you know, the, the whole thing, fair doesn't mean equal. That, that, you know, that's the really with salary is that some positions just make more. Some make less, but we try to be as fair as we possibly can based on what the market is and based on our budget. Um, and so that's how we we adjust these um, placements. And then, of course, we present it to the board and the board makes a decision. Um, but again, we always want it to benefit the employee. So whatever is better for the employee, being placed on the new guide or 
thing, your replacement will be on the new guide essentially, but it's going to be worth a new salary based on the percentage because that's better for you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And we, we know this is a lot of information. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of information and that's, you know, what you're, what you're getting is a culmination of a year's worth of work mm -hmm. that, that Ms. Brown has, has put together. We've had numerous meetings, you know, from that very first slide, all the different times we've met with principals. We just met with principals again this last uh, week for staffing. So, so this is a culmination of, of a lot of in-depth work by Ms. Brown, uh, Ms. Piros and the, and the team to really look at, at how can we utilize our budget strategically and then also make sure that it is able to be for the long term. We don't, that's why we have that big contingency because if anything happens, we will be able to pay our employees, never have to reduce our, our employees cut mid-year or anything like that. That's one of the things that we're very fortunate about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Rajivich. One thing and 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 for being transparent, like always, is when you Okay, here, this information right here, the results section, it factors in the benefits that we received as administrators. Okay. I want to make sure that we, everybody recognizes that we did not left out the value of the benefits, because that has been a tremendous recruiting tool for a district. Um, we all know the cost of health insurance. We all know the cost of of that and our district provides that covers that for administrators um so that those numbers and the cost of that is embedded in in the numbers that i'm presenting to you as the results any any questions on the on the compensation study before i move away from that No, I did. I have a question. Okay, like, like depending on the the minimum would be, let's say, like a a first year teacher or a first time employee. Let's say that you're moving somebody from one position to the next, so you would pay them the minimum, right? Possibly, so, possibly. So, so that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. So, so one of the things that that Ms. Gross and I worked to to look at placement is so if somebody moving into a new position, so. Uh, the recommendation that you'll see is like, for instance, Ms. Cabetta going from a principal to the our director. Yeah, the director. Uh, we want to make sure that it doesn't take a pay reduction, but we also have to figure out what is the best way to move her across instead of having that minimum, give her years of experience for administrative duty. Yes. So, uh -huh. so that would be, so it doesn't necessarily mean, so somebody that has zero experience may be on that very first placement or somebody new to the district uh -huh. right there. but like her like so she would if she would even go into depending either on midpoint or maximum right okay. depending on all of her experience. experience and what we can but what, what we can validate and and be able to say yes this is a fair placement okay that's you asked me yeah very thank good you. question thank you so that's an excellent question and it's a position that's good. this year we did something um, that position that was reclassified. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Um, so it went from being a manager. I'm gonna go back. Mm -hmm. You'll find it here on grade 30. Grade 30, starting at 62. Mm -hmm. And it was reclassified to a director. Grade 34, starting at 75. So it was reclassified. And the director level was aligned to market. So two things happened to that position. That position. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yes, now, it does. Now, HR works with superintendent to then align the individual based on the individual's experience on the placement guide. Yeah. And, and education that, and all of that comes into this. Yes. That's an excellent um, question. Because that was a position that was unique this year. Yes. Of reclassification and then placement to the market as well. I had a question regarding compression. I mean, maybe this sounds absurd to you, but like I'm looking at people that have 
20 years of earning as much as a person who has four years of experience. How do you explain that? In, in which I'm just going back to this on the salary schedules you provided us here, mm -hmm. people and the years of experience in the schools. I'm going back to this. It could, it could be education, could be. Are we looking at the detailed by by individual. individual. Oh, okay. Oh, by individual. So That's this, that the years of service is that the years they've been in the position, in the position they've been here, right? Okay. And, because I always, when I was a teacher at the high school, even at Calabasas, I used to always wonder, like, have none other people that come in? They've only been there a few years, and they're making as many people have been there. Just, it's outrageous. And then it could be that, I mean, one of the things that we always do is try to obviously give everybody the raise. That's why we moved away from steps, because steps, you know, it's a percentage, and then that gives you opportunity to get a much bigger increase. But then, you know, the thing that factor in is somebody's education. Yeah. You know, that's that's a, a big factor that moves you across the investment guide <laughs> salary schedule. Um, so if somebody is getting you know, their master's degree, then they move over. Um, and the person may be there for many years, but never took any additional education classes. And so they just get their annual increase. incremental increase. That's where it could... Differentiate and cause us some separation for those individuals. Right. Now keep in mind that there's a policy that regulates how many years of credit the superintendent may award upon hire. Right. They, so they brought that from their former districts. So I understand that. So the, I think that if I have 15, the policy limits me to 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then Mr. Verdugo can come mm -hmm. to ask for five more years. But that's not reflected in this. I mean, this is true years. These are years, including whatever you brought into the district. So if he's referring to a spreadsheet that you put together with the list of steps, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the years of service, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've been doing that job for all those years of service. Correct. On the teacher? Yeah. So That's it's, totally right. It's not reflected in here. In other words, if they have three years, does it reflect the 10 that they might have brought in? Is that what it is? Correct. Correct. That's just years of service with us. Okay. All right. Not that, well, that could explain a lot of the big jumps or the... Mm -hmm. It doesn't even show... Even Stephen, with people who, who are, have 20 years. In other words, their years of experience have, are not reflected on this sheet. Wow. in from a different district. Okay. That's just years of service with the district. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Another initiative that we're looking at was a performance type and for administrators, and I'm turning over to Mr. Redugo to go ahead. Uh, thank you. So one of the things that we, we've talked about um, years and years ago, we used to have a performance uh, based stipend for administrators. Um, and then through budget cuts, <laughs> lost Quite a few things. Administrators lost um, the performance stipend. They, they lost some additional uh, opportunities that they were previously paid for, and we never brought those back. And so um, now that we are in a much different physical standing, um, one of the things that we wanted to do is provide an opportunity for performance pay for um, administrative staff. You know, and so that's one of the things that. Um, Again, there's going to be a criteria. So what we're looking at is, is adding some type of criteria that goes above um, and is measured. So like we have for teachers is 301. So we wanted it to be um, an amount that you know that they're performing additional duties. You know, because right now we have um, administrators that that teach 301 don't get compensated for that um, and do additional things. Um, membership in outside organizations representing the district and a lot of different things. Um, so it, this is a, a way to recruit and retain administrators um, and by providing additional compensation. And I've never been an administrator, but I'm telling you from what I see, I think it's really, I mean, my colleagues might really disagree with me, but 
it would have been a big loss of tens of thousands of dollars for that. That's <laughs> the three or one money. All of a sudden, it's cut on you guys, and you guys just grin and bear it and don't say anything. But I think you guys have lost a lot of money because of that, because of rules changes. That's really affected people. It really hit people hard in the pocketbook. I'm surprised you guys didn't bark more about it. Yeah, you know, I think that's <laughs> just like we we all do. It. We all get into education for. You know, the, the job it's never about the, the, the compensation but it's something that as we are able to compensate you know like i said with like started with teachers so we went above the 20 by 2020 i think that i'd even go out on a limb dave and say that whatever we compensate we would see here as a bonus or whatever wouldn't even come close to the loss of 301 right right but but that's something again that we we want to make it sustainable. We also want to, you know, be be fair and, and understand that it's uh, additional compensation, and and the, these individuals are are twelve month employees. You know, and so that's the other thing, and so they're, you know, doing things throughout the year, and it's just an, an opportunity again to have them come up with a, a plan that says this is how I'm performing, and give them additional compensation. Yeah, no, is that set? Because I see uh, criteria will be perform ba uh, performance based with measurable outcomes. So, who, who sets the outcomes? So, they're, they're supervisors. So, what we would do is then we bring that to the board just like we do with the 301. And so, um, what we're looking at is to tr figure out what that criteria would look like and have a menu. Um, so, like 301 has a menu of different things that you can do to, to make sure that you're completing that performance. So, we would do that with the um, individuals. So, like uh, for people that report to me, I would meet with them and they would say, okay, how are we going to, what's going to be your measurable? Is it going to be like for Isela, would be uh, that does she receive the um, oh, auditor award annually? That's measurable. It shows, you know, how many uh, deficiencies there were and then they get the award. You know, what other criteria you know, that, that we can show that they are meeting you know, above, beyond, we do it with me. Yeah, you know, and that's uh, state mandated. You know that part of my pay is is performance based, and so you know, and, and you see my criteria, which is is very large. You know, and I come back and then show you what my goals are. We would do the same thing with the administrators that these are the goals that we would like you to to show. And I, and I think it's you know, if they don't meet it, then we say, hey, you you only get a thousand of that portion of you know, just so that we have a criteria. I think it's. Um, it fits with what we do with our other employees. And it's something that I think we have a lot of staff that go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. This is just a way to say, hey, we appreciate all of your efforts. And they can choose not to do it. They can, it's just like 301, they can choose to say, you know what, I'm good with it. Um, I don't want to have to, I want to teach 301 this year. I don't want to do this, you know, to, to try to make this additional $2,500. So that'd be objective, correct? That? Uh, that would be a performance objectives. Yes. Not subjective. No. I think I said what I said. No. Again, what I said, David. So then those are objective would be created by you. With the with that individual. Running it through the, the administrative team, or how's that going to work? So we we would demonstrate so that we would come up with the criteria, have that menu, bring it to the board, and then the board would approve that these are the, the goals or if I could do with me. Yeah, with you, it's stated. I understand that. Oh, yeah. That's it was something that I've never had done before. Yeah, I've seen. But if other districts are doing this, no. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's again one of the things that, that separates. This is the consequence of losing those tens of thousands of dollars to three hundred one. Yeah, we we yeah we were usually compensated for teaching three hundred one, and then the board chose not to during budget cuts, and then it never came back. Um, so you got clobbered. Was performance based on letter grades? And then letter grades, and then letter grades was an additional. Well, see, that's objective. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so you know a criteria like this, 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 and this. It has measurable outcomes. It has measurable outcomes. It should be right. Well, I'm just saying, but that's a, I don't think it could be compared so much to what a superintendent, because that's more with you and the board. Yeah. 
That's what the principles what you're bringing up is. You got to meet these goals. This this academic teacher retention, could be, it could discipline, be, it could be. everything that's on the evaluation. Could be. Then that is how we could read it. Yeah, could be could be tied to the evaluation. You could say if they. We but I mean, anybody then could see it. Dude. That's what I'm saying. There's yeah. no. There's no. It's everything's out there. Yeah, we would bring we bring, we bring it to the board so that, that once we once we develop that criteria, we bring it to the boards so that the board can can see and it. It's it public it. monies. Anybody could see it. Yeah. So the plan would be approved by the board. Yes. Yeah. And then um, the results we'll have to approve the award payment. Yeah. So it, it also would also come back to a public meeting to show whom who reached their goals right and who didn't. right yeah, i hate to harp on this but you guys the parental parenting classes are those still going on and are, are those run by administrators they're not run by administrators or, or parent liaisons mm -hmm. what we what we're able to offer is typically coordinated by the liaisons um and i think it fluctuates from year to year depending on a variety of things but the administrators do not facilitate and then zero, yeah. this zero, to, zero to five is through our partnership with the Family Research Center. And I don't know if Dr. Lenderwell has any additional. I still teach them. Yeah. But you still do. Okay. Well, but not as. Zero to five. Yeah. So zero to five. Yeah, I, think, I think everybody has <laughs> additional things. And this is you know, an opportunity to <laughs> do that. Mm -hmm. Would that be a stipend then? No, it, it, it'd just be a performance. They'd have to meet the criteria. A stipend would mean that they would be would guaranteed. Right, right, right. That's why I didn't understand. Okay. Keep it to do a nursery no, after after. Again, it would just be similar to more career one, similar to what my performance is that I had to demonstrate the board that I met these goals. And we would just go over the criteria. I think some of the word. word from a three one perspective, we talk about um, performance in there. And and the menu of options are um, you participate in these professional developments that are considered best practice that will make you a more effective teacher. And each of those collectors have a final product that they have to do. Typically it's some sort of a reflection thing or some form of advice. And when they successfully complete the training, that's considered having met the standard for that performance. Under very, very origins of you know, probably around 20 plus years ago, it was um, if your if your test scores come up, you know, you'll get the money. And that's what that's what people how we're defining uh, performance and, and an objective measure. Exactly. That's the Ames test, you get the money. That was well, I've been really going back 20 plus years. And this district, I remember specifically Denise Blake. But who was, was one of the driving forces behind trying to separate that because that's where you immediately on the second day of trying that person with the AP students versus the person with the special needs students, the yellow and so on and so forth. PE. Yeah. PE, exactly. Where's PE fit? And how do you measure that? How do you the mile and things like that, right? So so performance, I think, has morphed in the district as well as the state to meeting certain criteria that are predetermined off of a menu. And those those things that are determined should be considered all just used from best practice. So I, I'm now I guess I'm making this up. He talks about you know being a um, you know he wants me to have a goal of expressing or uh, demonstrating more leadership in the community. So I don't just join a an organization Rotary. I become you know the president of Rotary, or I I do something that drives leadership. I can't guarantee that's going to raise anybody's test scores. But if my supervisor confirms that makes me a better leader and best practice says that a district with strong leadership will ultimately raise test scores, then I think that would qualify for meeting that performance. It's not like it's a big chunk of change here either. I mean, it's just like 301s. You've, you're somewhat objective to that. I'll say that before because I've done it. I've given 301 goals before. It, it is, there's a, it's a gray, it's just a, like you were just saying, it's not real specific. Mm -hmm. So it is somewhat objective. The other thing, and we have to be careful as we draft that criteria, is that it doesn't impose more cost on the district for the administrator to reach the criteria. <laughs> okay, so being very silly. So in order for 
your CFO to reach the criteria, I need to attend a national conference in London. <laughs> so, and then I'll come back very knowledgeable and then I'll read better and I'll reach my, you know. 4,500 all the cost is 4,800. <laughs> right. okay. So that, those are things that we, as we put together the criteria, we have to keep in mind so that we keep that measure, that estimated cost that I'm presenting on the and, and and part of it again is it's you mentioned there is it's it's a forty five thousand dollar investment and to make sure that we retain and keep team in, in place and recruit and and show that they're performing and doing other things out, outside of what their regular duties are. As long as the bullets are the same, the objectives are the same for across the board. I think then we're equitable. Everybody has different. Everybody has different jobs. I mean, principles could be similar, um, but the different jobs have different. Well, I realize that. Yeah. I'm just saying that yeah. within the within the, within each job categorical. I think, I think we could make that yeah. right. I mean, we only have one HR director. Yeah. We're not competing against an assistant principal. You have completely different jobs. I understand that, but yeah. as long as you're equitable, that's all yeah. the same. It's all right. Any other questions? Moving into the salary increment. So the the number that we are projecting for next year is the five percent increase. So you can see the cost associated with the five percent for the different employees. Note the last line is for a 5% for those administrators that would not benefit from the compensation study. So it's either or. It's not like they're getting adjusted as a result of the placement plus, plus a 5%, okay? No, no, no. It's either or. Either an adjustment because of the result of the study or a 5% because it's better. Um, so just best practice is to um, annually adjust the certified placement guide to prevent that compression. Um, and the, the recommendation would be to adjust the placement guide, the certified placement guide, by half of the salary increase that we would recommend. So by 2.5. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is all um, pending approval. None of this has been approved. Right? Um, that would make the new starting pay for a thirty-six thousand one hundred and twelve. The estimated cost is seven thousand seven hundred and eighty. Now moving to the year of benefits. Year of benefits, medical and teledoc, um, and including the. The information just keeps changing because when I made this in presentation to Angie, we were still pending the response from Kairos. Now we have the answer from Kairos, which is the other um, insurance provider that work, um, that's under the trust. So um, the ASFAIT gave us a 9% increase or loss ratio. That is the amount of claims that they pay out versus the amount of contributions that they received from us. It's 100%. That's not, that's not good. Industry standard, they want to see that number in the to way over 100%. Um, so they're paying more on benefits versus what they're collecting from us in the form of contributions. Um, so their, their renewal rate came in at 9%. Now, we, and um, like I said, this is fresh information, so I don't have it for you, but when we bring back the, the recommendation to approve the insurance, we will provide you with a side-by-side -side comparison of Kairos versus ASVATE. Um, I can tell you that the presentation, the information that came in from Kairos is higher than ASVATE and the amount of benefits that they have, their the designed package of their benefits is less than ASVATE. With ASVATE, we have what we call the gold level right yeah 
Placid gold. Placid plan. gold. Um, Kairos doesn't, doesn't offer even that. offer that program. So all of those employees, and the majority of our employees are under that plan, would lose benefits because we would have to move them down to a plan that offers less coverage. Okay. So it, And it would cost them more. So two okay. things would happen to the employee. They would lose benefits, and they would be paying more. And the district would be paying more as well. So, and, and you'll have, like I said, that side-by-side -side comparison of your next um, board plan. And the recommendation is to cover this for employees. So it, it was not a very positive year for insurance. Um, we were well over. Um, there's uh, what they call it, the loss ratio. Loss ratio was was well over. We were at one hundred and nineteen percent. So that so getting only a nine percent increase was probably good um, for the team, but it's something that. Again, we will continue to cover. So it, it's a true 5% salary increase that we're not playing the game that the agencies do, where, again, they give you a raise, but then don't cover the insurance increase, and then you end up losing money. So we will cover the insurance increase. Correct. The piece of the of, um, coverage or plan that did not increase, it actually decreased, is the coverage in Mexico. Which has become um, very for those yeah for those employees that have had the opportunity to participate and actually received medical attention in Mexico we have only received positive um, reviews so we will continue HR is looking to schedule some meetings to continue to promote that because it has resulted um, as a true good good benefit for for our employees which brings me into the second. Um, uh, insurance, which is dental. Dental, we opened to the market. We said, well, let's see what's out there, right? And last Friday, the RFPs were due, and we received seven. We received seven providers that were um, that submitted an, an RFP for us for dental. And we're looking to accomplish two things. We're really looking to partner with a provider that has actual providers in the area. Our current provider is Delta Dental. And there are no dentists in the area. And when I say the area, we is south. <laughs> All right. I'm not talking Sawarita, Tucson, Marana, Oro Valley. I want providers Green Valley. here. Or Green Valley. I want yeah. providers here. Um, providers that can Our also... builders all say that's local. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um the the I'm also looking for an opportunity to expand the dental coverage into Mexico because that is also very popular. So those are the two things that we hope to accomplish. We have a meeting this Thursday to evaluate the proposals that came in so we can come mm -hmm. back with the recommendation. Do we list our who takes Delta currently to our staff? Do we have a list of local dentists that do or in or in Mexico? I know there's one across the line that is actually taking deal. Um, we Delta provides the directory. We don't do like our own directory. We use their directory that they post online. But yeah, there's very few on this. But then they post Mexico. Yeah. Right. So that's why I'm saying, would we want to go the extra little step here and maybe do that? So really yeah, say yes because it doesn't matter to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I mean, I'm just saying. If you go, if you take your insurance under Delta and you take it across the line, so the provider across the line will say, yes, we'll take it. But then when you when they submit your claim, Delta will read it as an out-of-network claim. And they will only reimburse you for, what is it called, customary? Yeah, rate usual and customary. Like mm -hmm. Yes. So. Minus any more fees, I assume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'll give up to two claims a year. I'm just saying this because maybe this is something again that we're going for extra that we could help provide that service. And we may not even be with them, as you said. Mm -hmm. But they were one of the, the RFPs that we received. So they did um, provide us a proposal. So we'll compare them 
against the rest, you can see what brings the best value and benefit for our employees and buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, life insurance, we're pending to receive some quotes. So, and asterisk on the bottom is exactly what Mr. Verdua was saying, that um, it is our plan to keep the employee contributions the same so that we don't pass down any of those um, increases. Reclassification. I mentioned earlier that sometimes because of market um, demand, because the type of uh, job that the employee is performing has changed or evolved over time, uh, we receive requests to reclassify positions. In this case, the slide shows two of them that came through and that had been board approved. Okay. You can see the cost and the position. Staffing changes. So this is the result of all the meetings with the principals um, about their staffing and what do they need to address and to meet their goals. And then we keep in mind the, um, the class size recommendation <clears throat> that we have to guide our conversations. So um, based on, on and what we know today, we always, always have one FTE as a set aside in case we experience last minute growth. Because our community sometimes likes to wait <laughs> until the end to register. Okay. Um, so we always have one FTE as a set aside. Then we are giving a new uh, or a new additional classroom teacher. Uh, earmark for first grade at Mountain View. Um, a science teacher for Ririco High School. A social studies teacher for Ririco High School. A new alternative ed paraprofessional for Ririco High School. Um, two PE paraprofessionals for middle schools, one at Calabasas and one at Guatimundi. Um, a new security guard for the high school. That doesn't include what we voted on today with regard to Hector leaving Sunica. No, this is additional. This is additional. Additional. Yeah. Additional. That'll turn into a vacancy. Sure. I suppose the governing board wants more than one security guard. Is there going to be compensation for that? So this. How many security guards do you have right now? Currently, we have three. Two and a half. Not three. One comes in at eleven, right? On Wednesdays, it's correct. Is it Wednesdays? Yeah, because twenty first century grant right currently covers for them to be full day. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. That would be three then. Except one day. Okay, one day. But one day. But still. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had this discussion with regard to mm -hmm. other you talk about market and other districts. Well, I mean we start talking about that. We need to move to four. Security yeah. cars. <clears throat> Plus the 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 cameras, right? All the and that's so it's going to really help. Well, I only say that because we have cameras in neighboring districts and seven security guards with with the SRO, SR, SO officer. I mean the sheriff's officer. Yeah. SO. You can say SRO, school resource officer. School resource officer, mm -hmm. yeah. So even if we take the school resource officer off, that's still six. We already did this. I mean, we discussed the six for what, 1,800, 300, one for every 300, and here, and 1,400 plus, three. I mean, we say three, which is not quite the case every day, but it still doesn't work out mathematically. We add one more, getting closer, but with the numbers, proportions, but. We couldn't be over if we went to five. Right. Yeah, then we'd be over. That's, that's what you're requesting. It's an additional. I'm just saying that, you know, there'd be a four in the, in the, in the SRO. But that would be that, that would be the next year. That would be. No, no, no. What, we remove the SR, the SRO. <clears throat> so there should be three. So there's four to six. That's yeah. a double amount. In neighboring districts, and we're talking about market and comparing districts. Well, 
Again, we do the math. The accountant the SRO is one of our. No, 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 we didn't because we have an SRO. So we got an SRO and then we're going to have four security. Yeah, mm -hmm. at the high school. Yeah, that's what the recommendation that is. That's what the recommendation that is, is to four you. And one. Mm -hmm. we have six and one for 1800. We'll have 1300. 1400. 1400 plus. Getting closer. Right. So, so your marriage would like to have five. So then it would be proportionate if you had five. Right? Mm -hmm. It would be over. Unless we get more students. Yeah. If we get more students, then it could be. Well, five for every three, one for every 300. Is that what yes. you said over there? Yes. So what's five times 300? 1,500. Mm -hmm. so how many students do we have? 1,400 plus. Mm -hmm. We're getting close. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, it's the staffing of that. And I'm going to throw this out there. It's the staffing of that. I used to have problems. We had seven security guards at one time, too, over there. And I, the big thing was always stop holding hands. Spread out. Get out to your areas. Rotate your areas. Not being standing together and talking all the time. Because if you're standing there socializing, you're not covering areas. And then mobility, which we, can we talk about mobility in this meeting? May we speak about mobility in this meeting? Yeah. Okay. Remember, we talked about possibly getting some sort of golf cart type situation to get down. Or a bike or, or a bike or anything to that effect. It's your quality, too. You know, and I'm not throwing rocks at anybody you have currently, and I'm not saying that. I'm just so saying it out there. This is the question. So, you want to add another security guard? That's for sure. Right, right. Well, I can't do that myself. I did. That's, of course, the, you need the whole governing board approved to agree with that. So, as of now, I think it's okay, but what if the numbers grow to 1,500 and we see the need for it? Maybe we could add it to the budget. Then we could add it to the budget. That is it. That's what this conversation is for. Exactly. That's why I was looking at that same saying that maybe we should look more on just in case. Because this is all provisional, right? He said yeah, that we haven't approved any of this yet. So then we can, we can say that we can add that FTE. I'm just, we're not making any actions, nor motions, nor nothing. Okay. I'm just saying. We can say add an FTE contingent upon reaching this amount of enrollment. Yes. Then you, you hire go. that person. This is our yeah. Christmas list. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Remember that we can fund anything. We can't fund everything. Mm -hmm. So we can add the FTE and go from, from contingency to add that FTE and then make it contingent upon hitting a certain enrollment mark. Then if you, you hit the enrollment, you bring in the resource. That if you don't hit the enrollment, you start your contingency. Will something like that alleviate the concern? We, we can add that. I'm looking at the staffing changes. How, how did they come up with the amounts? Like uh, the last one, increased term for contract media center technician, 10 days, $9,000. Like that's a big jump. Oh, because that's um all six. the employees, all all the media center technicians that we have, which is six. a total of six, oh. six, and taking their daily rate, okay. their hourly rate times the number of hours per day times ten days. So that like the three additional days for the tenants clerk said at all five sites is not very much. Right. But if we did the ten additional days for them, then it would probably be okay. So it's so what it says um, technicians or. Clerks, it's it's multiple people versus one individual. All right. mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. That's a good question. We probably should have. Yeah, sure. That's probably listed. Probably have have that listed that is that is multiple people. Okay. Thank you. I'll add that. Okay. One more question before we move on, because I'm I'm looking at the paper right here. Salaries. Yeah. So I see a lot of teachers that are first year 32, 30, 34. Are they getting the 5% and that's the 23, 24 amount? Am I reading it right? But a new teacher coming in would start base pay at 36. Correct. Is that the new? Yeah, 36, 9, 12, I think it is next year. Yeah, so these teachers that have been with this are going to be making less than what a first year teacher would be coming in at. Yeah, I think there's a, some some type of there might be, mistake there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a group that started late. 
Is it got here late? Are there national teachers? Yeah. I was just looking at all oh, the way I down. Was, yeah, like he started October. Mm -hmm. He was in it. Yeah, we are international teachers, and they all took a while to get here. Okay. So their five percent would be based upon what their full year amount will mm -hmm. populate the full year amount here as if they were here the whole year as long as they're here. is this their full year amount right here, no or? this is their prorated amount so okay. starting here these people started on day one okay 36 012 because that's our minimum everybody above started late 3601 mm -hmm. so they were here the whole year from here mm -hmm. okay. will those teachers start at uh 1.5 years or will they start at one year as long as they were here the majority of the year which they all were they got here usually like in yeah, so september or october mm -hmm. so they were here the greater portion of the year they'll get credit and they'll be eligible for the five percent increase on the whole year for well, next year yeah so those so those so those technically those 31 30 they'll, they'll be at 37 8 12. 37 8 12. is that this year's new yeah it is 36, oh yeah, 36, oh, 12, at a minimum, that would be their placement. Yeah, that was, the, that was their, that would have been their placement this year if they were. If they had gotten here on date. And then, and then, so their raise would be based on that 36, oh, 12. Mm -hmm. The entire. 7, 8, 12. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always, I'm always uh, throwing it back like Alexis, you know, 20 years, 36, I know she was an eight, um, uh -huh. many of those years, but. You know, starting out at 36. I, I feel it's an injustice, but. Yeah, because this is her first year as a teacher. The teacher, yeah. She did. Yeah. The first year. She's, She's been like in the, the district, district for 20 years yeah. as a paraprofessional. Yeah, it seems like she should be compensated for 19 years with the district, but that's just me. The other part, too, Brad, is she, she might not have a grad a degree. Mm -hmm. I think and she does. doesn't. No, she doesn't. No, she, doesn't. She, she doesn't. I'm sorry. Just remember, under like we have some people who are in programs mm -hmm. with teaching certificates. He has a, a a degree. It's just not special ed degree. Okay, so mm -hmm. just continue. Mm -hmm. But on the bright side, those years do do count for her longevity stipend. Right. Even though it might be hers. And that's what year as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Well, she gets the fifteen hundred dollars, right. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So on the top with decisions on the bottom changes to the term to the number of days in the term, the length of the term. And then we come to decisions that were um previously funded from the grant, and this list is going to expand. Um, but it's decisions that were previously funded by a grant um that is going away. And we had a portion of the clipping would become for it. So we're going to bring that into the MNO. And then we had one security guard that was previously funded by the proceeds from the human source lease agreement, which we repurpose entirely for the full. So we're going to bring that position back into the Okay. Those numbers that you see on the slide are going to be um, as a matter of fact, today we met with Rio Rico High School to go over their program. Um, this is an overview. Those are the areas that we were looking at to absorb into a new that they were previously funded by participation fees, um, AIA, tournament and papers, ticket takers and security um, for events. And then we have expenditures that were previously funded by the 100th day grant, which was suspended effective January 2nd. Mm -hmm. this year. So, so we don't count on that. The grant is no, no longer active. <laughs> in, in 20 years, I can tell you that they have never pulled a stipend mid-year. They have never pulled a grant. I'm sorry, I said stipend. They have never suspended a grant in the middle of the year and then completely changed the requirements because they created a new grant program for us to apply. But now some of the expenditures that were previously funded by the grant are no longer allowed in the new grant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, we're working through that. Department of Education? Yes. No, this is 
governors. And so this was the, the grant that uh, Ducey gave us 100 days because we stayed open during COVID uh, for those districts. And then the new governor said that's illegal, supposedly, even though the federal government said whatever was expended, you could expend. But instead, they tried, they pulled the money back and now made the remainder um, a new grant that is competitive and open to any school district. So, so the slides go to um, with that said, uh, I'm going to give my big, all my wisdom, my bleedings here. <laughs> For the athletics, we're not bringing that back, or you guys aren't planning to bring that to us back. I know we did a moratorium something, but we're not planning to bring that back. Right? No, we're not bringing the athletic site. Please. The piece. Participation piece. For the piece, we're not bringing that back. It's not in our plan unless the board as a board decides to bring it back. I told you that was one of the three mistakes I ever made. Yeah, no, Mr. Chairman, it's not in the plan to reinstate and then how are we going to compensate those? I don't know. Okay. That's a good question, Mr. Kramer. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and so so these and we went again, like I mentioned, we met today to, to review a lot of athletics, which would have a lot of expenditures that we were looking at through. You know, one of the things that we've always wanted, I know those of you that have coached, is to have off season stipends because, you know, that, that's again one of the things, just like we're talking about the administrator uh, performance pay. This is something that we think can separate our district is to, to have coaches be compensated out of season because we know that. Their off season is still season. You know, they, the coaches work and and coach. We want them to. That that's been our expectation. Is we want them to build programs and do things in the off season. So that one of the things that we're going to do is look at funding those off season stipends. And we were doing it through this grant, but now that grant is removed. So now we have to find a new funding source, which would be M and O most likely. Okay. Well, we're just at a funding some of those, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share that with you just to, to, to give you a data because it, um, athletics is, is a big expenditure. It's, it's a very big expenditure. Um, and, uh, again, we, we want kids to be active. We want them involved. And, and we want our coaches to be involved. So that's one of the reasons that, that we are looking at these off-season stipends. And, and we were discussing this well before the grant um, and how we can do that because we – we want to build our programs and we know that it takes coaches that are committed and we know that they are, but this will help compensate. And it, it, it's not going to compensate them just like the regular coaches. It doesn't compensate for the amount of hours that they put in, but it at least gives them something that we understand and we appreciate your efforts to make our program better. That's, that's great. I, I like that idea. It's a lot of coaches, as you well know, put in a lot of summer work. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The program never got compensated. <laughs> so, um, the principals expressed concern with their um, amount of dollars that they received for their MNO allocations. Um, so, each um, school gets an amount of um, operating dollars so that they can buy their consumables. Um, inflation has hit across the board. So, we are going to um, do a 5% increase to the school's allocation to be able to offset some of the increase that they are experiencing in the cost of their consumables. Um, and just so that the board is aware, we, we, with your policies, we have a board policy that says we will cover or, uh, all of the supplies for student teachers. And so this will, as prices have increased because of whether it be COVID now, everything, you know, pencils, it increased everything from, you know, they always say supply chain issues. You know, that's that's the favorite term. All of the supplies have increased. We want to continue to do that because that's our poor policy. We don't want, so that's the other thing with, with teachers. You know, they all say, I, I spend this in my classroom. And we really try to push with them. Don't spend on materials. If you need materials, ask your principal because we are funding it. We, we set money aside. We want them to be able to, this have their salary go home, not go back into the classroom. And so same thing with students. We don't want the back to school blitz 
to, to take the what they get and then bring it back to school. That's supposed to be at home for them. So we same thing, any student supplies, we should be providing those and we have the board policy that backs that up. We also want to make sure that we budget that way so that students recover that cost, teachers recover that cost so that it, it's on our burden to make sure we provide supplies. So. That, just to go through the wires, that should always be coupled with people holding them them accountable for how they check stuff out because or they ask for stuff because all of us here who talk can tell you we all we'd always find that one teacher that just you know open their cabinet door and they're just they're hoarders you know <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about supplies talking about Mr. Fanning that way yeah what are you why are you talking about me <laughs> they, they always have supplies that have enough to <laughs> supply the whole district oh you know God, yes. yeah. But but again, it's something that we really I always had it. Want to make sure, yeah, and, and we want to make sure that they have the supplies they need uh, because uh, there should be no reason that students don't have what they need in the classroom and teachers don't have what they need in the classroom. You still use the supplies from Rio Rico, you know, down there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <really? Yeah. laughs> <laughs> So, and Brad said this is touching. Why'd you tell me, Brad? We have other three departments that are supposed to receive an adjustment to their um, MNO budgets. And we can see that it's the Office of the Superintendent, the budget that's for the governing board, and the increase for the HR department to recognize the, the cost of professional development for the new HR director. Um. Moving on to the operating side of things, um, utilities uh, very modest ten thousand dollar increase to account for new square footage. Um, the trust we're still pending uh, and not giving us an increase for the new year, but because we're adding square footage, I'm expecting them to adjust more for yeah. insurance or coverage. So, all right, <laughs> this oh, I guess. Mr. Verdugo and I talked about this and I tried to do some research about it. You guys, we should know this because it is kind of does impact us as a Rico. Many years ago, we fought against Liberty Utilities to raise, not raise water, but this. Swobin was on that board. We hired an attorney. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're spending close to a million dollars paying for close to a million dollars, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. for waste water, waste for our utilities going into sewer whatever is it close to that is i've seen something like three hundred thousand three times go back and look mr Kramer, okay right? never let's guess uh, that's what i was looking at something close to that where that money goes and i'm not throwing rocks but i'm just going to say liberty utilities we did question what was going on there and said no that's not right we're for spending that much money and you as in the those of us that are in the areas that have sewer in rio rico if you're not on septic are paying some cost here. Oh, yeah. All that money goes to Liberty Utilities, which pays for them to pump it to the international waste. Who controls the international wastewater? Exactly. Who's getting it? Where are they? Who are they paying? We don't know. It's hard to find out. It's hard to dig that up. And it's hard for me to try to track that down. And I even sent to the Corporate Corporation Commission. The point being, I'm saying it is, we're spending money for something, and I'm going to keep doing my research. If it means getting and again hiring somebody that can actually dig that up and say, "Where's this money going? Where is it? We're paying them. Where is it going? What's happening to that money? Are the expenditures are going to the city of Nogales, whatever. I'm just bringing that up because it is part of the utilities, and I want to say that maybe down the road we we'll talk about this further because it is important. But the taxpayers are getting footed for the bill. Well, are we getting? Now, Kramer, are other districts paying that same amount as far as Nogales? And well, Nogales controls their utilities, correct? You pay the city of Nogales? The city know? of Nogales. Right. They control it, so that, that goes to there. And they obviously pump it again to the international. And the international wastewater on Rio Rico is where all that flows. Right. Well, is the city of Nogales controlling it? I don't know. I'm just bringing that up because I just want to say it is, if this utilities and we're paying into that, before as a board, 
we stepped down and said, hey, that's not right. But we didn't allow them to raise the rate. And we're bringing that up for food for thought in this utilities picture. Thank you. May I speak? Absolutely. I'm sorry. Come next year. When I went to the um, Corporations Commission, I got really fast response and service. So I don't know if maybe we need to contact them again because I, I was really impressed with how fast they interceded. And I would think they would have the knowledge and the answers to Mr. Kramer's questions. I can definitely reach out. Sure. Um, one of our biggest con this contracts that's still pending um, the, the renewal is um, or facilities contract with Sodexo. Again, I am putting dollars in there to because I'm expecting an increase. Once again, going back to the increase in square footage, we'll have to take some areas. Um, and then we also have been talking about operation savings, uh, Mr. Ramirez, with ESSER dollars, we were able to offset a portion of that contract and use one-time COVID dollars to pay for that contract. Now then, those starting to go away, we're going to avoid that expense back into it. And then last but certainly not least um, is just a, a quick glance of what the state is considering. Um, nothing is set in stone. I'm still pending approval. Uh, so the fiscal 24 aggregate expenditure limit, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, still a threat against K-12 funding. Um, governor's proposals that will provide us with additional funding is increasing the base level um, by 3%, more than the 2%. The, the notice where he wants to pull the money up. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, by suspending the results-based funding program. Okay. And bringing the, the ESA program back to pre-2022 um, status or level of funding. And that in itself, I think it's the biggest um, political battle that they're going to have. And then, um, and then doing a 2% inflation, inflation adjustment to capital, which would be very beneficial. Anybody have any questions? You don't have to ask. It just we've been cordial and allowed everybody to speak whenever they wanted to. Anybody? I just we always are competing. You go. We go a competition. The neighbors to the south, their daily sub rate is one sixty one. Ours is one forty seven. Daily sub rate. Substitute teachers, if they're living in Rio Rico Nogales, they're getting 161 or 147. And where are you going? Depend on the principal and school and all that. But sometimes when it's about money, there it is. The hourly rate, if you're going to cover a Nogales high school class, how much do you get paid? 40 bucks. 40 enough. bucks. What do you get paid at Rio Rico High School? 21. Big difference there. Long term, 200 to 168. I think that again, if we want to be in competition, we're talking about salaries and raising salaries, while our substitutes are are sometimes a backbone of what we need them. And if we're not raising the rates either on that, that could backfire on us as well. We're higher in salary, but our sub salaries are sub. Play on words, huh? All right. Second one is, and Dr. Lunderville, we talked about this. But I'll ask you one question. Carla Soto, did you say that you learned a lot from her in the days before, right? She was big, big on the PSW program. She supported it. She had the district, Nogales Unified, put in money into it. He transitioned school to work. Okay. Yeah. The district would contribute 43%. 
wasn't somewhat familiar with that because she had somebody working with me in that program. The district would put in 43%, the state gives the rest. For instance, we bought five, or excuse me, $30,000 worth of copy machines in 2015. The district now owns those because after five years, the state gives up ownership. Imagine what we could do with those copy machines. Granted, it works through our students that have IEPs or anything to that effect, but it is a good program. And again, that's why I asked you about this card. That was much, you learned how to be like this. <laughs> good one. Correct? Right? That's a compliment for the district. But that money was spent because the returns were so much greater that we made 60, we made the 60,000 that we would spend out printing stayed in district, which paid then for another, for Michael's salary that ran the print shop. Mm -hmm. And I'm just bringing that up because if we're looking for the future to save money and to build again on what we're doing in this district, it's a very good program. It doesn't have to be with, but it certainly would be good because it would offset some of our costs. But I think if we had money up front to get that going, the state is fine with it. They're like, hey, Julie, I, when I talked to them three or four years ago, they're like, yeah. I thought we had the TSW program at one time. I don't know. Not where it's functioned out of Volk Rehab okay. like that, and work with, along with that, they're supposed to be there. I remember a lot of our students were working out of Garrett's and other. Oh, but that's, that's under Dr. Um It wasn't TSW? No, I was. Oh, it's something else. And she, she's been overwhelmed. I can understand that, but I think that we try to help Dr. Lunderville in that sense as a board and whatever we can do. Because I think it's a it's a win-win situation. All right, but like in the last budget housing we talked about, Mr. Verdugo, why is it that you and I sat at the same presentation? Remember we talked about where other districts were purchasing or get, had land. I don't know what land we had, but they're talking about building. And I think. And were you with me? I don't know if we were there. But well, they're talking about other districts. Chino Valley is doing it right now. And they're building small homes. Habitat for Humanity is funding them. Chicanos or La Casa could help us out. Again, it's working with the district. They fund and build the homes. And we have, if we had land, I don't know, all the land is over in floodplain, but it's just a thought that we could try to work on doing that, <laughs> provide housing for our teachers where it offsets and we then collect the rent at cheap. They go really low. We saw Arita had something with regard to building uh, bail. 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 Bail built uh, some mini houses. Mm -hmm. This is all about expended spending money to save money mm -hmm. in the long run. <laughs> the last one, and John Hayes and I talked about this and up here on the on teaching abilities are coming out. <laughs> Renee, you're familiar with Camino Cano and La Pasita? Yes. Right? It's going like that. I can do one, two, three, four, five, six. These are lots up there on that hill. These two lots were purchased by a person, private owner right here. These two right here were former Vitari lots. Who now owns Vitari lots? Okay. County. This one and this one are owned by the Kramer clan. This one used to be part of Vitari, but it's a buildable lot. Who owns that lot now? Some of the buildable lots, Mr. Jackson got them. Oh. All those lots. Not all of them, oh, but geez. some of the building ones. Oh, that was part of Atari's agreement when he bought. And I'm not throwing anything about Mr. Jackson. That's all good. He's a yeah. business owner. But again, the Atari lots are right here, now owned by the county. All those taxes that were back taxes were over $5 million this district lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This district lost $5 million. The fire department's about $2 million. Now, when they sell these lots, who gets the profits? I don't know. Can you sell them though? Yes. You can. Yeah. Even if they the county can now sell. So they're they're selling them with the deed. Oh, they're okay. not able to remove the deed. So if you just want land. Right, but if that gentleman from Oregon, who bought lot number one, and then I guess he bought lot number two, he may want lot number three to add on to his property with the deed of it. He could put horses there. 
Yeah. I mean, you can do mm -hmm. whatever. Just right. don't bring utility. Exactly. Yeah. It won't perk, right? You can't perk. Or whatever. He can perk, perk one and two. Point well, being on all that is, I'm not trying to make a big... I'm just saying, as a district and or fire departments, again, if those are being sold, are we getting any of the proceeds? We should be getting per tax. Right? No, that doesn't give us budget capacity. No. It does give us cash, mm -hmm. which will help us when it comes to um, calculating our tax rates. I change it override. Exactly. This is something that I think that we should be also looking at, certainly. And again, fire department, I mean, the same thing, the fire districts, I should say. Not so those are unimproved lots. With these. Those are unimproved lots with a restriction, Mr. Lemonis, on them that you may not bring water into. Because they don't. However. It was, it was, it was uh, what's here is the name of yeah. the company. Yeah. I don't right. know. But so, the more the p part of it is like Bill Clinton. It's like a bizarre clause. Like you cannot sell it or bring water perk to the property until Bill Clinton's oldest grandchild is fifty or something right. strange. Exactly. But yes. that's the clause. It's something about Bill Clinton and some. But it doesn't future. say that he cannot perk this lot, which this oh. lot perked. Right. He bought this one. He buys this one. It doesn't say you can't stop from bringing water over there. What if his son or grandchild? I don't know. What if he doesn't? <laughs> well, the key word is unimproved because they can't build upon them because they can't. But he could build on numbered one and two, and then run his own whatever he wanted to. Uh -huh. on the three. Again, he could then buy those lots at a pretty reasonable rate. Yeah. The big thing is that what I really that was good was that if they sell them, we should get our fair share for the taxes. Right. Yeah. And we, we should, you know, just like sometimes updated taxes, taxpayers pay. Um, the treasurer's database puts the taxes back to the corresponding entity. So yes, and it's, they still have all. Yeah. So they can go back and you can see that. Yes. What you pay and everything else. Mm -hmm. Again, bring it up stuff because it is a budget and it does impact our budget. Thank you. That's it for my questions, Mr. President. Thank you so much. That's the contribution. Thank you for doing your homework on that. It really benefits us. Millions, millions. We can collect it somehow. Just never turn your back on the class again. Because yeah. Renee was in it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that when I was a teacher, that was any reader. <laughs> Yeah. Other than I may have been getting a number one and behind me, but that's okay. Uh -huh. I think that's it. Does anybody have any else? Anything else they'd like to contribute? No. No questions. Yeah, but that we have a meeting on the eighteenth. We we can adjourn this meeting at seven thirty-three. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very 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 very